Welcome to Cybody Therapy Anatomy Labs. Today we are going to be talking about the pathology known as endometriosis. Let's start with the definition. Endometriosis is going to be a chronic inflammatory condition that involves proliferative tissue known as endometrium or endometrium-like cells that end up outside of the uterus inside the pelvic cavity. Now this can include sites like the ovary, the uterine tube, the outside of the uterus itself. It can also include the uh, peritoneum and other surfaces found inside the pelvis and the abdominal cavity. If you're already feeling lost, that's okay, because let's revisit what the endometrium is. It is partly in the name. Endo means inside. Metrium is going to be a muscular layer of some type of cell. And the endometrium is located on the inner layer of the uterus. The uterus has multiple muscular layers because it is a muscle. It is capable of stretching, reacting, cramping, and waves of rhythmic contractions, which many know whether through periods or labor. Now the endometrium itself is the functional layer where embryos normally implant and it literally grows out these little fingers of tissue each month through the proliferative phase of the menstrual cycle. And normally, or if you're seeking it, an embryo will come along and it will use that surface to attach and beginning, begin pulling nutrients out of the female body. Now, if there is no implantation, no embryo comes along, then that layer is actually shed. It is cut off from its blood supply. The uh, in, internal part of those cells actually separates. It is actually squeezed rhythmically by the uterus. Those would be period cramps. And the whole layer separates and is eventually pushed out through the vagina. Anytime I'm talking about this, it is not lost on me that I do not experience this and I have endless sympathy for those of you with a uterus that do. Now let's get back to endometriosis because this is where these cells are now found on the outside. And what happens is that they are no longer confined to the inside. They are no longer going to be sloughed off during that time of the month. They are going to find spots around the pelvic cavity and they are going to begin to infiltrate. Remember, they are no longer going to be leaving the body, they have no way out, but they are still going to continue to respond to the up and down cycle of the hormones. And so they are going to grow, they are going to bleed, and then they are going to do it over and over and over again. And that is where you end up with chronic inflammation. Let's talk about symptoms. If you haven't guessed by all the previous mumbo jumbo that's going on there, this is going to cause a lot of pain, okay? And I wanna drive this point in particular home, that if you are having painful periods, and I mean excruciating to where they are debilitating, they are making you stay home from work, they're interfering with your daily life, or anything like that, that is going to be a pathology that is not normal. And it has been normalized across male and female providers, as well as just the general population that pain every month, just pain in general, is something that women are supposed to just deal with. And that is not the case. The next one is going to be a nagging, kind of burning fullness that you feel through your abdomen, your pelvis. It may feel like an upset stomach. This is often misdiagnosed as irritable bowel because it's just because of the area and all of the things that can happen. There's a lot of conditions that endometriosis can mimic. Other symptoms that come along with this can be pain with bowel movements or urination, okay? excessive bleeding during that time of the month or even off cycle. So when you're not experiencing your period, you may still have bleeding. Pain during or after intercourse is also another sort of closet symptom. This has overlap with other conditions. So you need to make sure we're just going down the whole list and see if you fit more than one of these boxes. In addition to all of the physical symptoms, you can get the mental side effects as well. So you can have depression, you can have anxiety, you can have a general feeling of unwell, which can be misinterpreted as fibromyalgia. And if that wasn't enough, you can end up with infertility. So go back through this list and if you are checking more than one of these boxes, it's time to talk to a provider and see if this is the road you need to be on. The reason it is so important to get on this road is because it can take 
10 freaking years to get a diagnosis. How is endometriosis identified? What tests are you gonna be looking at, requesting or getting? Okay, it's gonna start with probably a general pelvic exam, just to kind of take a look around, see if there's anything that is identifiable through that, I hate to say it's not non-invasive, through the least invasive of the options for testing. Other tests or options that might be used are transvaginal ultrasounds. So with the wand where they put it up in there and they take a really detailed look around in sort of three dimensions. There is a blood test, it's called CA-125, and it is non-invasive aside from having to get a little bit of blood. Unfortunately, the reliability of it is kind of up in the air. It's not the most reliable thing. Now, there are other tests that may be, may be available where you're at that test for biomarkers of a different variety. So it might be worth asking specifically if they have blood tests available to test for endometrial biomarkers. If your symptoms add up and you have some of these preliminary options that are kind of meshing together, it may end up being that you look to the machines that can see inside of you. So an MRI or a CT scan. These are not always the most reliable because endometriosis can be very small and still cause a lot of pain and discomfort and other symptoms. And sadly, that means that we have arrived at sort of the, I always hesitate to say gold standard. I mean, it's always gold standard because it's kind of like a copper or lead option. And that is going to be laparoscopic exploratory surgery. So they're going to do a few little holes. They're going to fill the belly, the abdomen up with CO2. And they're actually going to put cameras in and go exploring, looking for endometrial lesions. Let's talk about medications. Now here we're going to arrive at a weird crossroads because there can be, medications can be used to further sort of filter whether or not you have this condition. So it is, endometriosis is hormonally driven. It's thought to be hormonally driven. So it's gonna be estrogen dependent. You have to have the big E in order to have this. And that's good news, sort of, I'm gonna qualify this, because it means that birth control, progestins, and less invasive things than surgery might be able to help you narrow down or control your symptoms and get some of your quality of life back. Now the bigger guns here are gonna be like GNRH uh, antagonists or blockers. So that is actually going to block the hormone from your brain. It is going to force you into sort of a flirtation with menopause and it's gonna shut down estrogen production and hopefully lead to a decrease in your symptoms. Now I say this with a huge qualifier that these medications in particular, the ones that actually shut down the brain chemicals can be pretty miserable because because menopause is pretty miserable. So you could get emotional roller coasters. It can change who you are as a person and that may not be the best option. This is officially your warning that we are now going to be taking a look at some slides of what endometrial tissue looks like. Now this is uh, gonna be close up views for the most part, but they can be a little shocking. So if you're sensitive to this, you may wanna kind of fast forward through this part of the video. So if you go the endoscopic confirmation route, you're going to be looking at pictures like this, or this is what they're going to be looking for inside of you trying to confirm this. It is going to be the small discolorations that are found on the uterus or uterine tubes, the ovaries, and throughout the peritoneum, the, the, just your abdominal and pelvic cavities and they can be very small. They can be cystic, something like this, where it's actually a bulge. Uh, there's deep infiltrating ones that actually don't look so bad from the outside, but they're actually three-dimensional or actually growing down into the tissue. These type can actually be seen on the scan. So like a CT or an MRI will be able to observe that soft tissue infiltration. As I said, the endometriosis is a chronic inflammatory condition. So that means the immune system gets involved and it is trying to clean up these spots. It's being constantly and chronically activated. And so that means that whenever you get 
when you get white cells trying to do their job, immune cells, they generally are like a little war machine. And in this case, they're not going to be very discriminatory. They're not going to, they may damage healthy tissue along with trying to clean up the endometrial tissue itself and even the leftovers. Now, this is one of the things that is not known why the immune system cannot just get rid of this entirely. Unfortunately, it has a bad habit of instigating what's called scar tissue. And so here, if you get it in certain locations, it can actually lay down scar tissue, which then can contract or remodel. It can cause things like kissing ovaries. Uh, it can cause bowel adhesions. It can cause basically any of the parts that are in your abdomen. This can cause them to adhere to one another. Now that probably sounds bad, but the reason it is so painful or can lead to even more symptoms is that a lot of our tubes, our intestines and our bowel and all that stuff are smooth muscle and they are sort of rhythmically contracting throughout the entire day. And so if suddenly they have a bunch of adhesions kind of stuck all over them, they still have to move. And so it will tug and it will cause the stretching of nerves, activation of pressure sensors in the bowel. And unfortunately our bowel, if you've ever been, everyone has experienced bowel pain can be incredibly unpleasant. I'd like to take a minute and apologize for traumatizing you if I did. Now let's move on and we're going to talk about the complexity. This, I cannot overstate this category. Uh, this is part of the reason it is hard to diagnose. It is hard to treat. And the cause of all of this remains unknown because no one actually knows what's going on. So here we're going to have some interplay between the chemicals that normally drive or the hormones that normally drive reproduction. So you're going to have progestin and estradiol, estrogen, those, those two big ones. Uh, there's also going to be some immune system involvement. It is not technically an autoimmune disease, but no one is certain how it circumvents the immune system once it is out in the pelvic cavity, why it is not completely cleaned up. Other things that are going to be involved here, there is a genetic element to it. If your mom or your mom's mom had this condition, you sadly are more likely to have it. Now this has an odd connection with the normalizing of the pain because if it runs in a family, it means that your grandma may have told your mom that painful periods are normal. And then your mom told you that painful periods are normal. And this is one of the cycles that happens. It's sort of a generational form of misinformation. So remember, if you have incredibly debilitating periods, that is a pathology and you need to go to the doctor. Some of the other factors, and this is getting into the theories of endometriosis, which is an entirely separate video, but you may have stem cell involvement, and that can be either from the bones or the leftovers of the time that you did not develop into a male. Okay, so whenever we all start out, we are both sexes. A lot of times you hear, oh, we all start out female. That is not actually accurate. We start out both. Okay, and then we differentiate. So there's this system way up here. We'll just throw up the graphic here. There's a system way at the top that is actually both. And then according to the hormones that you receive, generally dictated by your chromosomes, you generally, and I'm gonna use that term a lot here, go down one of these paths. Unfortunately, biology is very messy and you don't necessarily have to end up on just one of the paths. You may have more of one or more of the other, and some people are both. There's a couple of other factors here that may affect this. One of those is going to be retrograde menstruation. That is where instead of the endometrium being squeezed out of the vagina, it is actually squeezed up through the uterine tubes and into the abdominal cavity or pelvic cavity. This is a very old hypothesis or theory. It has been confirmed that this can happen in monkeys. Obviously, no human person is going to volunteer to be basically infected with endometriosis. I want to qualify because a lot of people get a little spicy when I say retrograde menstruation. That is absolutely a real thing. It happens in 90% of people with a uterus. The part that is up that is contentious is 
how it doesn't end up, why is endometriosis isn't more widely spread. And that is where we go back to those cofactors that some people, if they have retrograde menstruation and they also have another one of the factors, their immune system isn't doing their job, they have some kind of stem cell thing going on in their bones, or it, it, it makes it more likely for those endometrial cells to take root and then begin growing. If you thought the last point was contentious, wait until we talk about body weight. However, on this one, I have good news for you. It is neither a skinny or fat disease. You can be very thin and end up with this and have risk factors for it. Like there's studies showing that low body weight may support the start of this. There is also support that if you carry a lot of extra weight, that you may also be at risk for this. So it's sort of that middle portion that is the least risk for developing endometriosis. This also means that when we talk about lifestyle changes for this condition, they may not be overly beneficial. Now, I want to mention that eating a healthy diet, okay, including all of your veg and all, those, all the things that you know you should, is always good. Okay? Getting more activity is always good. And it never has to be extreme, I'm not telling, I never tell anybody you have to go to the gym and start doing this, okay? I am a plus size individual, but a 30 minute walk, if you can manage it or you can start doing it, is going to make your body as a whole better. Do beware of the people who are out there telling you that you can you know, modify your diet and you can start exercising and you're gonna fix this. That is, not, that is not remotely possible. You might support some of the treatments, you might feel a little better, but it is going to be hard to make these changes when you have things like anxiety, depression, constant pain, feeling unwell, and being literally unwell for a, you know, a week to a week and a half every month. That's gonna be hard to implement lifestyle changes. Along with lifestyle changes is going to go supplements, okay? I do not push or sell supplements. I don't even trust people who do. So take these with a grain of salt because these are the ones that as far as I could verify actually do have evidence behind them. The first one is gonna be your omega-3s. So healthy fish fat, basically. You can take the pills. I can't stand fish. I hate the scales. I hate the taste. I hate everything about them. So I take the little pills. Going along with that is going to be ALAs, alpha lipoic acids. Hopefully I'm saying that correctly. Correct me if I'm not. Uh, that's just another component of fatty fish oils or oils in general uh, that can be anti-inflammatory. They have been shown, both of these have been shown to help manage some of the symptoms and at least minimally affect their ability to spread. And that's going to play into that inflammatory response. The next one is a mouthful. It is going to be N-acetylcysteine. It is N-A-C. That is a precursor to glutathione, which is produced in your liver. And it is a widely known uh, beneficial, it's an actual medi medication for lung infections. It can bring down inflammation. It can thin mucus, all kinds of amazing things there. This is one that's worth looking up if you're into taking supplements. This last one is called DIM, and I'm gonna identify it as DIM because I'm going to mention this pronunciation otherwise, but I'm going to try it just for the hell of it. It is going to be diindol di indol lemon methane diindol methane dim. Now you see why I'm saying it's just dim. This has some crossover with the medications because it is an aromatase inhibitor. It's just a natural version of one. Just wanted to pop in here really quick. If you're getting value from this video, I would love if you would subscribe. It means a lot to me. All right, let's get back to it. Here, I wanna branch off in an odd direction for some of the weirdness that comes along with this condition. Most of the time, we think of this as a female-only disease or malfunction, but there are actually about 20 cases worldwide of this being found in men. Now, we know, it is widely known that it is estrogen-dependent, so in men, it is, you have to have a cofactor. So a lot of them come with, they may be taking estrogen therapy. So that is found in like prostate uh, cancer treatment. Uh, they may be transitioning from one body type to another. Uh, there's also obesity. So if you're a man and you carry a lot of extra weight, your estrogen levels generally can be higher. That is only, That one is exceptionally rare. There's only one case where it could be linked to that because he didn't have these other cofactors. But it has to be something 
that is driving estrogen for men to get it. Well, we're on the note of weirdness. This is not confined to the pelvis and the abdominal cavity, okay? They have found this on the diaphragm. They have found this on the lining of the outside lining of the heart. It has been found in the nose, so in the mucosa of the nose. Uh, and all the way up into the brain on like the cerebellum. Okay, and this is where we get into some extreme weirdness. And this is also where a lot of the theories, whichever one you pick, start to have uh, a breakdown because here it's almost behaving more like cancer than your own cells. Last but not least is going to be treatment. How do you get rid of endometriosis? Okay, the one I wanna drive home is that hysterectomy, even complete, even radical, where they literally take everything, ovaries, uterine tube, the uterus, all of it is gone, will not fix the problem. Some of the versions of endometriosis can actually produce or seem to be able to produce or convert other chemicals in the body into estrogen. So once they are out and sort of localized in their sites, they no longer need the estrogen from the ovaries to drive the process. They actually have a converter built right into the cells. So if hysterectomy doesn't do anything, what is the, what is the cure? Okay, so the cure is not a cure, okay? It's a, it's a cure, it's like that kind of cure. Uh, is going to be laparoscopic surgery. This is, again, that term that I hate, gold standard, okay? It's the laparoscopic exploratory surgery taken one step further, okay? So they're going to go in and they're going to individually look for each one of those sites, just like in the, the pictures that I showed you, okay? So they're gonna be looking for the cysts, the infiltrates, all of those things, those dark spots. They're gonna be going in, they're going to either be cauterizing them or they're going to be, you know, like, plucking them out of there, removing them surgically. And the reason I say this is a cure is that it can require more than one surgery to make sure you get all of them. Uh, it's generally, like you need to find an expert surgeon for this and there are plenty of lists out there. I will link some of them down in the description so that you can find an expert surgeon who knows how to do this procedure because you want someone who's been doing it for a while and does and deals in volume, okay? You want somebody who has done a lot of them and because that's going to bring expertise and it's gonna bring quality to the procedure and your results. If this has felt like an absolute like whirlwind of information, I want you to know that I put together a free tiny guide to endometriosis. It looks like this. I have linked it down in the, in the description. It's gonna take you to Patreon. You don't have to be a patron to get it. You can just download the file, you can print it off and it can be used for you to get some more information, build a foundation and advocate for your own treatment. Because like I always say, knowledge is power. And if you're going to advocate and be able to push for a good result, you have to know kind of all the background to this condition. There is one more glimmer of hope, and I know that you've already had a ton of information thrown at you. So here, if you want to see or learn about a new test that is on the horizon, it is not currently available, but if you wanna know what to look for and when it is going to be available, that is actually going to be in this video right here. So you can hop over there and have a look at that. And hopefully, if you've already had some of these procedures and you're like, you still haven't gotten the answer or you're not not sure that you're left in this what I call the wait and see diagnosis uh, this test might be the next best thing for you because they're it's going to be amazing I mean they're talking about 90% accuracy so if you want to learn about more more about that just head over to this video and I'll walk you through it